Tonight, Facebook's Oculus VR acquisition perhaps raises more questions than it answers. The future of Bitcoin includes capital gains and how ATMs are being controlled via text message. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 51 for Tuesday, March 25th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com. Learn what you want, when you want, with access to over 2,000 high-quality online courses, all for one low monthly price. To try it free for seven days, visit lynda.com slash tn2. That's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash tn2. I'm Sarah Lane, and in a late-breaking story today, Facebook has announced it's acquiring Oculus VR, maker of virtual reality technology, for a total of approximately $2 billion. Oculus has received over 75,000 orders for development kits for the company's virtual reality headset, the Oculus Rift. The deal includes $400 million in cash and 23.1 million shares of Facebook common stock, plus an additional $300 million earnout in cash and stock. In a post on his Facebook page, CEO Mark Zuckerberg says that immersive gaming will be the first step for the two companies and that Oculus will continue operating independently within Facebook. Zuckerberg also says beyond games, Oculus will be a platform for many other experiences like virtual sports, classrooms, and doctor's offices. Joining us now to talk a little bit more about what this acquisition means is Eric Mack, who covers science and tech for CNET, Forbes, and Gizmag. Welcome, Eric. Thanks for having me, Sarah. Well, all right, we were, go we were all set to talk about a, a smartphone, which we'll get to in a minute, but first we've got to tackle this story. Are you surprised that Facebook was the company to buy Oculus and, and so soon in the, in the company's evolution? Yeah, it's it's very interesting, and I, I assume the people who initially invested in uh, Oculus when it was just a Kickstarter campaign are uh, particularly surprised. Uh, you know, you've got uh, a campaign that tried to raise just I think a little over a million and a half, and, and suddenly it's been sold for two billion. So it's kind of the best of all worlds for Oculus. I mean, they uh, they they get the the two billion dollar exit and. Uh, Oh, initial investors, nothing. Now I have to be wondering if the uh, the crowd uh, crowdfunding supporters out there are, are wondering where their cut is, though. Yeah, exactly. Kind of Everybody would have liked to have been more on the venture capital side at that point, but this is yeah. somewhat of an unusual situation. Online, it seems that the reviews, well, the the opinions of this union, although Oculus is apparently going to stay somewhat independent within the Facebook universe, are pretty mixed. Folks are uh, some folks are saying. They absolutely sold too soon because the potential for virtual reality is so big that it's almost as if the executive team over at Oculus gave up. What do you think about that? Um, you know, I, I think the all the reviews that I've heard so far, uh, well, I saw this at, at CES this year, and uh, everyone who, who tried it, you know, kind of walked away with the same Keanu Reeves response, which was either a whoa or a whoa, as in I'm kind of sick. Uh, so... I, you know what I think. What I think is really interesting is that uh, we hear that line a lot about the uh, that this company is going to continue to operate separately, uh, and so far that happens. But I think actually Facebook has yet to really figure out how to integrate uh, these big acquisitions into the Facebook that we know. And, and I think what's really going on here is that there, it's more about just buying up audience and buying out anything that buys for the attention uh, of the young folk. And I mean, we even heard uh, Zuckerberg on the call mention WhatsApp and uh, Oculus in the same in the same sentence. They're just trying to recapture growth, recapture youth, and basically recapture the future is my, my take. Well, okay, so let's talk about what the future of Facebook with Oculus as part of its huge umbrella looks like. Zuckerberg mentioned games. I guess that probably makes the most sense. The uh, virtual reality and gaming is something that, at least as a concept, we're all very used to. But then he mentioned things like going to the doctor's office virtually, uh, being in a classroom virtually. What does Facebook have to do with that? Well, you know, what's interesting is I think, like you said, they're, they really right from the beginning are positioning it more as a, a communication tool. And it seems to me something that maybe down the line could compete with, with Google Glass and, and other wearables. And, uh, you know, my mind kind of goes to maybe this could be the promise of uh, what we thought Second Life could be, but, you know, with the the addition of a, a billion users, and that could be interesting. But I also wonder if what's really going on here is maybe they're just preparing for the day that uh, social networking as we know it will die. 
and, and they want to be on top of the next big thing. So it's not so much about integrating it into the Facebook that we know now. It's betting on some sort of a future for technology. Well, I mean, I think the conversation is going on, and I'm sure that has to be part of the conversation, right, to integrate it into Facebook. But they kind of failed at that so far. I mean, partnerships with uh, names like Spotify haven't, you know, really gone anywhere. And, you know, I have to assume that they want to try to integrate it. But uh, there's got to be somewhere in the back of their mind they're thinking, well, you know, if this this whole Facebook thing some, somehow doesn't work out, we've still got Instagram and Oculus Rift and, Oculus Rift and WhatsApp to fall back on, perhaps. Zuckerberg says that, 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 that virtual reality is going to be the big next thing, you know, that we're sort of in a mobile revolution now and virtual reality is the next big quantum leap. Do you think he's right? I don't know. And, you know, I, it seemed like an obvious next leap for like 20 years now. I mean, since uh, since I first saw the lawnmower man in the 1990s, it seemed like that's where it's going, but it hasn't it hasn't quite caught on yet. So I'm going to be really interested to see uh, how things like Google Glass and, and the first round of smartwatches are adopted or or not adopted. And, and uh, I, I hate to to hedge, but I think time will tell. Well, before we let you go, I know that uh, you've spent a lot of time uh, with uh, l learning uh, about the HTC One M8. Of course, HTC had a rather large uh, press event uh, this morning, uh, which has been totally overshadowed by this Facebook news. But what are your thoughts on this new HTC phone? People say it's nice, but HTC has a lot of market share to, 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 to take from Samsung and the others. Um, it, it is really nice. You know, but my, my first thought about uh, the HTC One M8 is that HTC has finally really increased its portfolio of, of slick Android phones with really confusing names. <laughs> I don't, I mean, they started with the G1 and the G2, and then we had the One and the One X, and then slowly down to just the One, and now we have the One M8, which to me either sounds like a, a British intelligence agency or, or an energy drink. I'm not, I'm not really sure, but uh, we're more interested in the phone itself, which I think is, uh, I mean, it really impressed me without blowing my mind. Uh, my colleague, Brian Bennett at CNET, he did uh, a review. And, you know, when he looked for, uh, you know, cons to this phone, the only thing he really came up with was that uh, the back was just a little too slick. But otherwise, there was uh, nothing but good things to say about it. And it seems like a very solid upgrade that uh, maintains the best of the original HTC One while improving on it and also adding in some of the more successful features we've seen in the last year from things like the Moto X while improving on those as well well. So I think it's it's one of the best Android smartphones we've ever seen. So besides the fact that the name is a little bit strange, you figure HTC really has uh, a, a, has some leaps to make in the marketing sector. Samsung has been quite successful with that. And I keep saying Samsung just because it has such a big Android market share. What can HTC do if you're not so wowed by this, by this latest one phone to really be a player in this market? You know, I don't know. And that that's, I think that's what they're trying to figure out. I mean, they even made a little bit of a dig at Samsung during the presentation. Uh, they they kind of made a mocking statement about, you know, just uh, throwing tons of advertising dollars at a new product, uh, a, a pretty clear reference to, to Samsung. And, you know, I think they're they're going all in on, on design and hoping that they can uh, somehow uh, generate enough buzz that it'll take off. But it, it's really hard. I mean, I, I feel like one of the better I mean, the better phones of 2013, uh, for my money, were either the HTC One original or the Moto X, and neither really took off because they didn't have uh, that, that Samsung marketing muscle and that, that Apple uh, mystique. Virtual reality smartphones. Maybe that's something that Facebook's on to. HTC it's inevitable. could learn a little, bit, <laughs> a little bit from them. Eric Mack, thank you so much for joining us uh, to talk about some of our, our two biggest stories of the day. Tell folks where they can keep up with what you do online and beyond. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, I'm on, I'm on Twitter at uh, Eric C. Mack, uh, and I am also, uh, CNET's kind of my, my main home base. I also uh, write for Forbes and for Gizmag. Uh, if you go to the Crave section of CNET, I pretty recently did a, uh, a four-part series on, on my 25 years on the first 25 years of the web. That's a, a pretty interesting uh, read. It goes all over the place from Silicon Valley to Alaska and back. So I recommend checking that out on Crave at CNET. All right, will do. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Come back again soon. Thanks again, Sarah. Coming up, we've got new legislation in the U.S. anyway to limit the NSA's powers, how the IRS wants to define your Bitcoins, and Amazon credits for everyone. Maybe.
But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Lynda.com. With Lynda.com's video tutorials, you can learn at your own pace from industry experts. With a Lynda.com subscription, you get unlimited access to thousands of online video courses covering a wide range of technical skills, creative techniques, business strategies. Maybe you want to be a better photographer. You want to master new software. You want to learn web design. Brush up on your programming. At lynda.com, you'll find top quality videos on hundreds of different subjects. You can also watch from your computer or your tablet or your mobile device, whatever you want, whatever's most convenient. The instructors are professionals. They're experts. They're passionate about teaching. And each course is structured so you can learn from start to finish or just jump on and find a quick answer. It's $25 a month for access to the entire lynda.com course library. Or for $37.50 per month, you can subscribe to the premium plan, which also includes exercise files. You can try lynda.com right now with a free seven-day trial. Visit lynda.com slash TN2 to access the entire library. That's over 2,000 courses free, free for seven days. That's lynda.com slash TN2. And now on to our tech feed. The New York Times reports that the Obama administration is preparing a legislative proposal to change the National Security Agency's bulk phone records program. This is according to senior administration officials. Specifically, the NSA would end its systematic collection of phone data and the bulk records would remain with phone companies and they wouldn't be required to retain that data for any longer than they normally would. The NSA could obtain specific records only with permission from a judge using a new kind of court order. The proposal will have to be approved by Congress, but... Back in January, President Obama did say he had instructed the Justice Department and intelligence officials to come up with a plan by March 28th, that's this Friday, when the current court order authorizing the program expires. In its first ruling on the definition of Bitcoin, the Internal Revenue Service says that the U.S. government will treat Bitcoin as property for tax purposes, applying rules that it uses to govern stocks and barter transactions. So the decision could reduce the volume of transactions conducted with Bitcoin because investors will be treated like stock investors. Bitcoin miners will have to report their earnings as taxable income with a value equal to the worth on the day the Bitcoin was mined. If they mine as part of a business, they'll have to pay payroll taxes as well. Amazon has begun issuing account credits to Kindle book buyers as a result of legal set settlements with the book publishers that allegedly conspired with Apple to fix ebook prices back in 2012. The company says that the settlements address qualifying Kindle books purchased between April 1st, 2010 and May 21st, 2012. Reported credits have been anywhere from several cents to over $200. According to the Office of New York Attorney General Eric Schneiderman, the settlements with the five publishers accused of price fixing Hachette, HarperCollins, Simon & Schuster, Macmillan, and Penguin total $166 million nationwide. Finally, the future of ATM cath withdrawal is SMS. A group of cyber criminals, I probably shouldn't be smiling, have figured out how to get cash from a certain type of ATM by text message. Security vendor Symantec explains that the malware, dubbed Plautus, is engineered to attack an unidentified type of ATM. And in its most recent variation, the attackers open up an ATM and attach a mobile phone which then acts as a controller to a USB port inside the machine. The ATM also has to be infected with Plautus, but Symantec warns that about 95% of ATMs are still running outdated software like Windows XP, even though Microsoft is ending that regular support for that particular OS on April 8th. And that quote, the banking industry is facing a serious risk of cyber attacks aimed at their ATM fleet. Before we go, a little calendar update. Microsoft has announced it's renaming its cloud computing platform and infrastructure from Windows Azure to Microsoft Azure. The rebranding will take effect on April 3rd. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Write us at TN2 at twit.tv. Our next newscast is tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Do join us for that. Until then, I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.